Okay, so the calendar then. This has been an ongoing issue for for a while. I was thinking back as to when it, it was first brought up as an issue to me and when Yar started showing me the things about the calendar. And it must have been just before um, last Sukkot, because I remember, <coughs> excuse me, at last Sukkot going through why the calendar that we were following at the time was wrong. That was all the information that I had. All I knew was that there was never 13 months in scripture. Um, and so the moon couldn't be used as a reckoning and that we don't need to add in the 13th month. And none of that was scriptural. So all I really had was that piece of information. As time kind of went on, Yah started showing me more and more about it. And he did it in a really, really weird way. Usually I'll sit down with the topic and he'll just lead me through it. He'll show me things. I put all the scriptures into place and then when I'm going through it, he'll often show me what he's done, what he's put together and how those scriptures all fit together. But he didn't do that with this. What he did is he basically at every stage, he said, I'm going to tell you this information. So I'd say to people, you know, he's going to tell me what the calendar is. I don't know what it is. He's going to show me what it is though. Um, and then what he'd do is he would show me what, it was that he was going to show me in a very general form. So he'd say, it's going to be about this, basically. He'd show me that it was going to be about this particular thing. And then I'd be like, okay, so it's going to be about this. Like I remember doing a Torah portion at the beginning of this Torah portion cycle and being like, it's something to do with the stars. I don't know what it is. It's something to do with the stars, though. And then he would gradually, well, he, he'd show me what those things were. And it would always be at times that I wouldn't expect I remember when I was doing the um, the signs from Yehovah uh, teaching, um, I was I was thinking when I was going through it, I was saying about when people say things are from Yehovah and about how serious it is to say that something is from Yehovah. I was thinking about the calendar teaching because obviously I was reflecting on my own life and I was like, well, what what have I said is from Yehovah? I was thinking, well. I said that the calendar was from him because I'm sure that it, it was from him. I remember how it all happened. I was sure that it, it was from him. You know, how terrible would it be if it wasn't? And he hadn't given me any information on the calendar in a long time. But he chose that day to reveal two things about the calendar to me. Almost as if he was just reassuring me. He was just saying, no, okay, I am showing you this information. It does come from me. And I was waiting on... Uh, confirmation on one of the pieces of information. I was only able to confirm it on the equinox this year. And I'll show you that. Um, I didn't know how the moon fitted into the whole thing. People were asking about the moon. All I could say to them was, I don't know. I just know that he'll reveal it at some point in the future. I got some information on this equinox. And I knew that he wanted me to do the calendar teaching soon. I didn't know when it was going to be. Um, and he, he kept just propelling that forward, kept just showing me little bits. Um, and I knew that he wanted me to speak on it. And I said that I would speak on it this week because we were looking for something to speak on this week. Well, bear in mind at this point, I didn't have any of this information. I had just little scraps. And so on Monday, when I sat down, I had the first time to sit down and go through it. I, I remember praying and people know the way that I pray, what I do is I go to the point that I'm up to in scripture for the answer uh, to the prayer. I'll show you the scripture that came up in a little bit. But I sat down on Monday and I, I just asked him to reassure me basically. I, I just remember asking for some kind of reassurance from his word. And he gave me that and I'll show you that in a second. Um, but then I was like, okay, so you've reassured me. Now, I don't have any of this information. You're gonna have to show me this information. So this is Monday. And over the course of Monday, he showed me so much stuff. I put together 180 slides of uh, the calendar teaching. Tuesday, I sat down with questions. I, I still don't have it all. You showed me so much yesterday. If that's all that you want me to talk about, then that's great. Then he showed me loads on Tuesday. And on Wednesday, it was Yom Kippur, so I didn't have a chance to work on it. By the time it gets around to Thursday before I do a teaching, I like to have it put together so that I can then go through it and see those connections in it and get it all in order, highlight the bits that need to be highlighted, correct any mistakes. 
But I just, I didn't have it on Thursday. So I sat down and I was praying again. <laughs> I was saying, if you want me to have this information, this information about the equinox and how the equinox works with changing through the Chodeshim each year, then you're going to have to show me. And then by one o'clock, half one on Thursday, I had it all and the whole thing was put in place. It was just been an amazing experience. But I'll show you the scripture that he gave me um, on Monday anyway, the scripture for reassurance. Because obviously what was going on in my mind was nobody's had the calendar. The calendar's been hidden from people for ages and is this just, we've got the calendar now, is that right? Uh, you know, that's, that's been uh, some people's uh, problem with this. It's like, oh, so you've got the calendar. Everyone's been trying to do the calendar for ages, but you've got the calendar, have you? So it's going through my mind. I asked for reassurance. This is the scripture. I was up to Ephesians 3. It says, On this account, I, Paul, am a prisoner of Yeshua the Mashiach for the sake of you uh, Gentiles. If so be, you have heard of the stewardship of the grace of Elohim which was given to me among you. Again, what's this about? This isn't exactly about this. Maybe he just doesn't want me to give, doesn't want to give me an answer. Maybe he just wants me to step out in faith. Then I got to the third verse. Third verse says, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery as I have now written to you in brief. So that while you read, you might be able to understand my knowledge of the mystery of Mashiach, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men as it is now revealed to the set apart Shlokim and to his prophets by the Spirit. I was like, okay. There you go. <laughs> That's what he was trying to say. Because it's an audacious thing, an audacious claim to say that something is from Yehovah. And all the way through it, I've been not kind of plagued with doubts. I've known what he's been showing me, but it's, it's been a bit uncomfortable. It's a bit of an insecure position to be in, to be like, Yehovah is showing me this information. He gave me this, this scripture and then he showed me his calendar throughout the week. And it was quite amazing. Okay, so the first thing that I want to go through is the fact that the sun and the moon and the stars are his timepiece and they're the things that tell us the various aspects of things. Now, the last time I went through the teaching on the Chodeshim, I think people kind of got the impression that I thought that the moon was irrelevant, essentially. I didn't think that the moon was irrelevant. If it's up there, it's there for a reason. I just knew that it wasn't in to determine the Chodeshim or to determine what we would call months in English. So Genesis 1, 14 to 18 says, And Elohim said, Let lights come to be in the firmament of the heavens to separate the day from the night. Let them be for signs and appointed times and days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it came to be so. And Elohim made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. So you've got all of the lights there. You've got a greater light, a lesser light, and the stars. But they're the stars that you put there to separate the day from the night for signs, appointed times, days, and years. That's what the sun, the moon, and the stars all do. Elohim set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And Elohim saw that it was good. The sun rules over the day, but it's not just the moon that rules over the night. Psalm 136, 7 to 9 says, To him who made great lights, for his kindness is everlasting. The sun to rule by day, for his kindness is everlasting. The moon and stars to rule by night, for his kindness is everlasting. Psalm 148, uh, verse 2 says, Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you stars of light. Okay, so these are the lights. This is how scripture defines the lights that are there to separate day and night for signs, for appointed times, uh, for days and for years. Genesis 1.14, if we go back to that, Elohim says, Let light come to be in the firmament of the heavens to separate the day from the night. Let them be for signs, appointed times, days and years. Uh, what I want you to notice is that it doesn't say for days, for months, and for years. It says that they shall be for days and years. Now the word that's translated as month, what we have in English as month, is chudesh. Okay, the Greeks have it as uh, main. 
Numbers 28, 1 to 2 says, And Yehovah spoke to Moshe, saying, Command the children of Israel, and you shall say to them, Take heed to bring my offering, my food for my offerings, made by fire as a sweet fragrance uh, to me at their appointed time. So the word uh, month isn't mentioned, but the word appointed time is, okay, moed, my appointed time. And on the beginnings of your months, you bring near a burnt offering to Yehovah. Two young bulls, one ram, seven lambs a year old, perfect ones. So we've go, we're going to have, after verse 2, list of the appointed times. They include the beginnings of your months. And that word is chudashim. It's actually in the Hebrew, it's roshi chudashim, which means beginnings of your months. The beginnings of your chudashim. Uh, as to what the Rosh Chudashim are, there's two different types, and we'll look at that. <coughs> so this is what it actually says, the beginnings of your Chudashim. So the Chudashim are mentioned, but they're not mentioned as months. They're mentioned as appointed times. So what are Chudashim? That'd be a good question for us to answer. Ezekiel 47 verse 12 uh, tells us something interesting about the Chudashim. It says, And by the bank of the stream on both sides grow all kinds of trees used for foods whose leaves do not wither and fruit do not fail. They bear fruit to every Chudesh because their water flows from the set apart place and their fruit shall be for food and their leaves for healing. Okay, so every Chudesh these trees are going to bear fruit. And these trees, or one of these trees, is mentioned in Revelation 22, 1 to 2. It says, And he showed me a river of water of life. So the setting's the same. This is the millennial kingdom here. Clear as crystal, coming from the throne of Elohim and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street, and on either side of the river, was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, yielding its fruit every chudesh. Now, this is written in Greek. So the word there is actually main, but Greek don't have the concept of chudesh. They've just got the closest word to, like the closest word to chudesh in English would be month. If we were translating it into English, we could either transliterate chudesh and make a word that has the same sound, or we could just use month. What they did, they used the uh, Greek word for month. So how many months in a year are there according to this? There are 12 fr fruits, one for every month. There are 12 months. Okay. No 13th, 13th month anywhere in Scripture. First Chronicles 27, 1 to 15 um, also bears witness to this. Okay, so the children of Israel, according to their number, the heads of the fathers' houses and the commanders of thousands and hundreds and their officers, gathered in the king, uh, uh, gathered, sorry, served the king in all matters of the divisions, which came in and went out, chudesh by chudesh, throughout all the chudeshim of the year, chudeshim being the plural of chudesh. So we would have it in the English as month by month, throughout all the months of the year, each division having 24,000. And then we're told how many chudesh there are in a year. There's the first chudesh, one, second chudesh, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. There's no uh, division for the 13th month. Because there is no 13th month in scripture. It doesn't exist. It's a tradition of man. And it's because man has been using the moon to establish the Chodeshim. And that won't work out. So, what determines a Chodesh? Well, these are the problems, okay? A lunar month is 29.53 days. 29.53 times 12 is 354.36. We know that that's not a year. You get 12 and a half moon cycles in every year. So, does that determine the Chodesh? No, it can't determine the, ch the Chodesh. It's just a, just a tradition. So using the moon to determine the Chodeshim means that we have to create a 13th month without scriptural instruction as to how to do it and without a 13th month ever being mentioned in scripture. People will say, in Ezekiel, there's a 13th month because he lay on his side for 430 days. And then they'll make the assertion that that was one year. Never in scripture does it say those 430 days were one year. And if it was one year, it wouldn't give us 13 months, it would give us 15. 
So that's not, that's not a good explanation either. The sun, moon, and stars were given to us for the reckoning of time, as we saw. Only the sun's position as it travels on its circuit, which we'll look at through the stars, gives us 12 distinct periods that perfectly comprise one year. It's like a giant clock. You want to see where we're up to in the year? You look where the sun is in the various constellations, the 12 constellations that we have. This movement of the sun through the constellations is intrinsic to the concept of a year. Okay, the year is, the sun will start in its position and it'll end in that position according to the constellations and that gives us perfectly a year. So if we want to know what determines the Chodeshim, it can't be anything else than the stars. It couldn't be more obvious, in fact, that it's the stars that determine that. 2 Kings 23, 4-5 tells us something about these stars. Okay, it says, Then the king commanded Hilkiyahu, the high priest, and the priest of the second order, and the doorkeepers to bring out of the Heichel of Yehovah all the objects that were made for Baal and for Asherah, and for all the host of the heavens. And he burned them outside Jerusalem in the fields of Kidron, and took their ashes to Bethel. And he put down the black-robed priests whom the kings of Yehudah had appointed to burn incense on the high, pla- high places in the cities of Yehudah and in the places all around Jerusalem. Those who burned incense to Baal, to the sun, to the moon, and to the constellations. Okay, so if we were to look at this word for constellations, um, I use Blue Letter Bible to do it which includes what Jesenius has to say about this word. And what you'll see, what Jesenius has to say about this word is incredibly interesting. Okay? Jesenius says that they were, the, me, the word means lodging places or inns. So the Hebrews gave this name to the 12 signs of the zodiac, called in Arabic, whatever this is. These were imagined to be the lodging places of the sun during the 12 months. Okay, it couldn't be any, any more simple. That's what that word means. It means it's the lodging places for the sun as the sun goes on its circuit throughout the year. Very similar word uh, to the one that's used there is Maseroth. Okay? I think the other one is Masala, the Jews, but it refers to the zodiac. In Job 38, 31 to 33, it says, Do you bind the bands of Kima or loosen the cords of Kassil? Okay, and these are constellations, other constellations that aren't part of the 12 main ones. Do you bring out the constellations in its season? The word is Maseroth. Okay, do you bring out the Maseroth in its season? Or do you lead the bear with its sons? Now, this is Yehovah speaking, and he's talking about the fact that he does all of this. Do you know the laws of the heavens or do you set their rule over the earth? Okay, so Yehovah is very proud of the fact that he put the constellations there. I think that people kind of get the idea that it's all a bit pagan and oh, we don't want anything to do with the constellations. But Yehovah put the constellations there and he put them there for a reason. And they're there as part of his timepiece. Isaiah 47 verse 13 says... You are exhausted by your many counsels. Let the astrologers, the stargazers, and those who prognosticate by the new moons stand up and save you. So this is talking to Babylon. The astrologers, the stargazers, we can understand what those things are. We can understand that they're looking to the stars. It says those who prognosticate by the new moons in the English translation. That's just bizarre. But it actually says... It's those who prognosticate by the Chodeshim, which are the stars, the astrologers, the stargazers, those who prognosticate by the Chodeshim. So here we've got the two linked. The Chodeshim are referred to as another name, like astrologers, stargazers, prognosticating by the Chodeshim. Exodus 12, 1 to 2 says, And Yehovah spoke to Moshe and to Aharon in the land of Mitzrayim, saying, This Chodesh is the beginning of Chodeshim for you. It is the first Chodesh of the year for you. Okay, so when we're trying to work out what a, a Rosh Chodesh is, okay, people translate it as a, as a new moon. We can see the, the phrase used here. So this is uh, the Blue Letter Bible concordance. It says, this moon, this Chodesh, ha Chodesh, is this Chodesh, shall be unto you the beginning, the Rosh, 
Rosh of months. Ha Chudashim. Okay, so that's the plural. So we've got the beginning, singular, used of the Chudashim, plural. Think of it as this month shall be to you the beginning of months. So we've got a month here or a Chudesh referred to as a, a Rosh Chudesh. That's not the only way that the uh, word is used. Okay, and that will be the first Rishon month to you. Okay, so a Chudesh is a Rosh Chudesh. Numbers 10 verse 10 tells us of a different type. It says, and in the day of your gladness, in your appointed times, and at the Roshi of your Chudashim. So Rosh is pluralized here as well. Beginnings of your months. So we've got a month, which is the beginning of all the months. And then we've got the beginning of each individual month. Okay, the, the Roshi, or Roshi Chudashim. Numbers 28 verse 11 says, on the beginnings of your Chudashim. So again, you've got a month that begins all of them. And then you've got the beginning of each Chudashim, the first day of the Chudashim. Numbers 28 verse 14 tells us, this is the burnt offering for each Chudesh throughout the Chudashim of the year. Okay, so each Chudesh has the beginning of the Chudesh, and that is the Rosh Chudesh. And then you've got the Rosh Chudeshim, which begins all the months. And that is a Chudesh in and of itself. 1 Samuel 20 verse 5 says, And David said to Jehonathan, See, tomorrow is the new moon. Okay, it doesn't say that though. That's just the English. What it says is, Tomorrow is the Chudesh. Now the word Chudesh comes from the word Hadash which means to make new or to make renewed. So people will say, well, the moon is renewed each month. So it makes sense that a chudesh is a new moon. The sun goes on a circuit through the sky, and we're going to look at that. But it, it speaks of it going forth and then of it exiting the year. Every time that happens is a renewal of the cycle. It's a cycle that happens over and over and over again. And it goes through the 12 Chudashim, goes through the Ma'atzeroth. But that is a renewal in and of itself. It doesn't have to be the moon just because you can trace back the etymology of the word and say it's got something to do with something being new or something renewed. Okay, so he says tomorrow is the Chudesh. Then later on in the passage... It says, and it came to be on the next day, the second day of the Chodesh. So you've got the Rosh Chodesh at the beginning. Then you've got the second day of the Chodesh used, okay? Which is what we would translate as month. But you couldn't have, tomorrow is the month. And then later it'd say, it's the second day of the month. This uh, concept of the Chodesh is just something that we've not understand, uh, understood thus far. Okay, this is the Greek word for moon, uh, or sorry, for month. It means month, and they've also kind of tied it to the new moon, and they've done that for a particular reason. This is the uh, Thayer's Greek lexicon. It says that the word is after the use of the Hebrew chodesh, which denotes mo both a month and a new moon. It doesn't actually denote that. So all they've done is they've taken that understanding and they've put it on top of this Greek word. That's, the, that's why they say that this word means the two things. In Greek, as we've seen in many other things, Greek has a way to differentiate between two concepts that the Hebrew just uses one word for, like speaking in tongues and speaking prophecy. The Hebrew just says nava, whereas the Greek differentiates it. Okay, so in Greek, if you want to say new moon, like this is the New Testament, it says don't let any man judge you in respect of a meal or in drink or in respect of a holy day or the new moon. But it's not men, it's neomenia. And people will look at that and they'll say, neomenia, that's new moon. Okay, because neo means new. They just presume that men means moon as well. 
The Greek word for moon is this, it's saline. So if it was to say new moon, the literal new moon, it would be neo saline. Okay, so neo menia just says new month. Like a chodesh is a new month. The rosh chodesh is the new month. The beginning of the chodesh. Job 11 verse 8 gives us an example of when Greek does this. Okay, it says it's higher than the heavens. What would you do? Deeper than Sheol. So if we've got a concept that only exists in Hebrew, it is impossible to translate it into another language apart from by using a concept that is very similar to it, but not quite the same. So our concept of a month is very similar to it. It's not quite the same. Okay, we don't go off the moon for our months, although the word month does derive from moon from when people in the past have done that. The Greek word men doesn't mean chudesh. Our word month doesn't mean chudesh. So when it comes to a word like sheol, which is um, just intrinsically a Hebrew concept, the only way that you can translate that into Greek is to use a similar concept. So this is the interlinear Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. There it says Hades. Hades is not an equivalent concept with Sheol, but it was the underworld to them. So it was a close enough word for them to use. And that's exactly what we see with the word men or the word month when we uh, translate it into English. What I don't want people to get into their heads is that it's got anything to do with this. Okay, it's got nothing to do with horoscopes. What the pagans have done is they've looked up at the skies and they've seen these things which have been set there by Yah and then they've come up with their own story to explain what's going on there. They come up with their horoscopes and all of the significance that they attribute to it. But it doesn't mean that the stars in themselves or using the stars to track time is a pagan concept. It's not. This thing that we've had in the background uh, of the slides, this, is, uh, this was in a 6th century synagogue. Okay, and interestingly, it's got the Hebrew names for each one of the constellations there. I've not gone back um, and transliterated these into English to see what they would have called them. But, you know, people want to pause the video or whatever or come back to this. They're able to do that. But this is, this is a synagogue where they recognize the stars. Um, and I believe, although I can't say that it's definitely true because I didn't research it out but I believe that this is part of a calendar uh, a relief of a calendar as well which is interesting okay so a point that needs to be um, addressed before we leave the Chodesh is people think that the Chodesh have to be 30 days in length they do they have to be 30 days in length and this is what they'll tell you the reason is in the 600th year of Noah's life in the second Chodesh, the 17th day of the Chodesh, so second month, 17th day. On that day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of the heavens were opened. So this is when the flood starts. Second month, 17th day. And it says, and the waters receded steadily from the earth and at the end of the 150 days, the waters diminished. They started to recede. Okay, that was at the end of 150 days. Then the next verse says, In the seventh Chodesh, the seventeenth day of the Chodesh, the ark rested on the mountains of Ararat. So what people will do is they'll make an error in logic. They'll say it started on the second month, the seventeenth day. We've got the uh, seventh month, the seventeenth day mentioned here. So that's five months. We've also got 150 days mentioned. You divide 150 days by five, you come up with 30. So they say, there you go. That's... The Chodesh, they're all 30 days. Not what it says. It says the flood started on the 17th day of the second Chodesh. Then it says at the end of 150 days, the water started to diminish. And then it says on the 17th day of the seventh Chodesh, the ark came to a rest. Those two things are not connected. People are just making that leap, making that connection. I would say it's pretty obvious that when the waters start to abate, when they start to diminish, it's going to take a little while until the ark comes to rest. So that doesn't hold any water. Okay, so the equinoxes and the solstices, how do they figure in? Because people will say, where's the equinox in scripture? Which is a brilliant question. It's a question that I had up until Thursday. <laughs> Where are the equinoxes in scripture? There's things... 
Things that people misunderstand to be talking about the equinoxes, but as I've studied it out, I've realized what they're actually talking about. And we'll look at them uh, before we end. The position of the Earth in its orbit around the Sun, the solstices, equinoxes, or other time defined relative to the seasons, slowly changes. This is a problem, okay? because the equinox is not on a set date every year forever throughout the entire play of time. This People uh, came up with uh, various things that they were like, well, is this a problem to the calendar? And none of them were problems to the calendar. Something that was a problem to the calendar that I was aware of at the time when I put out the calendar teaching was the procession of the equinoxes. I remember speaking to Charlie about it and saying, look, the, the teaching has to go out to show what Chodeshim are and how they're reckoned. We'll work out the equinox afterwards and then we'll do an update teaching to it. But for now, and at the time, everyone was like, we need to know the calendar. We're about to start a new year. We need to know the calendar. I was like, I know I need to know the calendar so that I can do it. I know that the other one's wrong. Maybe Yah will show me. And I remember Charlie ringing me up and saying, has Yah shown you anything about the calendar yet? I mean, like, no, no, afraid not. And then like two days later, he showed me the, the thing with the Chodeshim. So the equinox slowly changes. And with these things I'm reading out, people are going to have a problem with some of the science that's used to justify these things. Ignore the science. Focus on the fact that this effect is a real thing that we see in the world, that the equinox moves. Just that's what you need to take away from this. But it goes on and says, for example, suppose that the Earth's orbital position is marked at the summer solstice, when the Earth's axial tilt is pointing directly towards the sun. One full orbit later, when the sun has returned to the same apparent position relative to the background stars, okay, the Earth's axial tilt is not now directly towards the sun because of the effects of precession. It's a little way beyond this, in other words, the solstice occurred a little earlier in the orbit, and it does this every year. Thus, the tropical year, measuring the cycle of seasons, for example, the time from one solstice to another, or one equinox to another, is about 20 minutes shorter than the sidereal year, which is measured by the sun's apparent position relative to the stars, which gives us the year, okay? Equinox to equinox is about 20 minutes shorter every year. After about 26,000 years, the difference amounts to a full year. So the positions of the seasons relative to the orbit are back where they started. So the equinox will move all throughout the Chodeshim 20 minutes every year. After about 26,000 years, it will get back to where it started. For identical reasons, the apparent position of the sun relative to the backdrop of the stars at some seasonally fixed time slowly regresses a full 360 degrees through all 12 traditional constellations of the zodiac at the rate of about 50.3 seconds of arc. Okay, you split a, a degree up into seconds per year or one degree every 71.6 years. Okay, so this is was something worth considering. At present, the rate of precession corresponds to a period of 25,772 years, but the rate itself varies somewhat with time. So one cannot say that in exactly 25,772 years, the Earth's access will, be, access will be back to where it is now. But what we do know is that the equinox moves throughout the year. This is Philo on the creation. This is section 39. This is what he says. He says, The sun, too, the great lord of the day, bringing about two equinoxes each year in spring and autumn, the spring equinox in the constellation of the ram and the autumn equinox in that of the, sta of the scale. So what we would call Aries and Libra. Okay, they had different names for them. As the Hebrews had different names for them and all the cultures have had different names for them. So it supplies very clear evidence of the sacred dignity of the seventh number for each of the equinoxes occurs in the seventh month. It doesn't appear before the seventh month. It appears in the seventh month according to him. And it will change which Chodesh it's in. The equinox is uh, relevant for us according to the scriptural instructions that we've got for a reason that we'll get onto very shortly. During them, there is enjoined by law the keeping of the greatest national festivals since at both of them, 
all fruits of the earth ripen. This is a really important piece of information. There's certain things that we don't need scriptural instructions on to understand. Just things that we understand about how the world works. We don't need scripture to tell us those things explicitly. But what was known to them is that all of the fruits of the earth ripen at a particular time of the year. That's the equinox. That's what marks when things ripen. Okay, so as long as we've got this piece of information, we don't need scripture to tell us that. We just live in the world and know that things ripen after the equinox. Everybody knew that. So that when we come to scriptural instructions, they've got a significance to us. Exodus 23, verse 15 says, Guard the festival of unleavened bread. Seven days you eat unleavened bread, as I commanded you, at the time appointed in the Chodesh of Aviv. And Aviv means that the barley is Aviv. It means that the barley is ripe. So when it says the Chodesh of Aviv, they know when that's going to be because all they need to do is wait for the equinox. And then after the equinox, the things are going to be ripe. So that's the thing that they would wait for. All they need to be told is that it's the Chodesh when everything becomes Aviv. And they go, oh yeah, we know when that is. That's after the equinox. Okay. Get something similar with Sukkot as well, which is in... The seventh month, of course. Perform the festival of Sukkot for seven days after the ingathering from your threshing floor and from your wine press. So all they need to know is when the equinox is, then they're going to know where the harvest is, and then they're going to know when Sukkot needs to fall, what Chodesh Sukkot needs to fall in um, for this to be uh, correct. So the equinox does play a role It's not directly spoken of in scripture. There's no word for equinox. All they needed to be told though was, it's when everything's ripe. They'd be like, oh yeah, when everything's ripe. This is understanding that has been lost to us. Okay, this is um, from my copy and I recommend that everybody, whenever you see any quotes like this, or this is a quote from Josephus, this is what Josephus says. Loads of people have got these quotes. They're not always correct. You can go online and you can get PDFs of these things. They're well past any copyright So you can go and you can check them. This is a book that I've got, which contains the Antiquities of the Jews uh, by Josephus. And it's book three, chapter 10. This is what it says. Okay, it says, Upon the 15th day of the same month, when the season of the year is changing for winter. Now this is going to be important to us. In scripture, there are not four seasons. In scripture, there are two seasons. There's the hot one and the cold one, for want of a better word. What we would call summer and winter. They're the only things that exist in Scripture. Problem is, when we come to the calendar, we're trying to fit everything into our reckoning. We're like, let's see the four seasons. And people translate things as spring that shouldn't be translated as spring because of their own reckoning uh, of those things. Okay, so when the season of the year is changing for winter... The law enjoins upon us to pitch tabernacles in every one of our houses so that we preserve ourselves from the cold of that time of year. Okay, so this is Josephus and he says it's the cold part of the year. It's going to be after the equinox. This is interesting as well, not to do with the calendar, but we've been wondering what do we do with the the boughs of... Uh, goodly trees and all of that sort of stuff recently so I may as well mention it. it says that we should carry in our hands a branch of myrtle and willow and the bough of the palm tree with the addition of the palm citron they're the four things that are commanded he doesn't say to wave them doesn't say to do any of that he says that we uh, carry them in our hands that's what the instruction actually says to do it says take for yourselves these things so throw that out there. I don't really know what that means, but that's just what Josephus says about it anyway. This is Philo again on Moses 2, 222. He says, Moses puts down the beginning of the vernal equinox as marking the first chodesh of the year. It marks it. After the equinox has happened, we know that those things are going to be ripe. We know what the right time to do all of those things is. So again, it's not explicitly referred to in scripture, but it is referred to in terms uh, that imply it after the equinox. These are the chudashim of the year. Very slightly different dates to the ones that we use. We use the traditional dates of when the equinox is and when Uh, the sun would enter into the constellations. That's what we had when we were just setting everything in places, the Chodeshima by the stars. This is the calendar that will go off. Very slightly different though. 
for this year, for 2018. Okay, so this year, it's not in the constellation of the ram anymore. It's in the constellation of Pisces. The other equinox is in the constellation of Virgo. And I'll show you what he meant when he, said, when he was talking about the uh, divine dignity of the number seven. Okay, if you've got the first month, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So he says that the equinoxes are always in the seventh month. Because then you go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And it's always the seventh month, depending on when that uh, season began. Psalm 74, 16 to 17 says, The day is yours, the night is yours too. You have established the light and the sun. You have set all the borders of the earth, all of these definitions, these boundaries. It says, You have made summer and winter. Again, they're the only two that you can see. And they, the words don't actually mean summer and winter. They're kind of just talking about the hot bit and the cold bit. We just would use those words because they're familiar to us. As long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest and cold and heat, winter and summer and day and night shall not cease. We're going to look at what their year would have looked like to them. They wouldn't think of it as, you know, uh, summer, autumn, winter, spring. They wouldn't have thought of it in those terms at all. The things that were significant to them are no longer significant to us. We've got things like the seed time things like the harvest, and other things which would have been significant uh, in their lives, which Yah lays out as their calendar. Isaiah 18, verse 6. Okay, they are left together for the mountain birds of prey, for the beasts of the earth. The birds of the prey shall summer on them, as in they'll spend the hot bit, and the beasts of the earth winter on them. Again, she uh, provides her supplies in the summer, gathers her food in the harvest, something we'll get to. He who gathers in summer is a wise son. He who sleeps in the harvest is a son who causes shame. The lazy one does not plow because of the winter. I hold that in your mind. The lazy one does not plow because of the winter. And you'll see as we go through the calendar how these things would have worked. At harvest time, he inquires and there is none. So this is very, very important, the harvests. Deuteronomy 11, 13 to 14 tells us about other significant times of year that we don't care about. Because we're trying to fit their calendar into our calendar. We're trying to work it out according to that. And it shall be that if you diligently obey my commands, which I command you today, to love Yehovah your Elohim and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, then I shall give you the rain for the land in its season, the early rain and the latter rain. And you shall gather in your grain and your new wine and your oil. These were items on their calendar. Okay, The former rain and the latter rain. Jeremiah 5, 23 to 24 says, But this people has a backsliding and rebellious heart. They have turned aside and gone away. And they do not say in their heart, Let us now fear Yehovah our Elohim who gives rain, both the former and the latter, in its season, in its time. It's not traditionally what we think of as seasons. Okay, so this is the word for former rain. yo -ra. We'll see here that it's translated as early rain or autumn shower. It doesn't mean autumn shower. So you might see the word autumn in scripture, but it's not supposed to be there. The, re the reason that it's there is because of our understanding of the seasons. You see, it goes from the middle of October to the middle of December. So we would call that the autumn rain. But the word autumn is not there. It's the former rain. This is the latter rain. Okay, the latter rain could be the spring rain in scripture where spring is not there and that's from March to April we would think of that as backwards the the former rain being later in the year what it pertains to though is the growing of crops it's called the former rain because what it did was it fell on the ground and it prepared the ground to have seed planted in the ground then the latter rain would come along and nourish the seed in time uh, for what we would call the spring, when the uh, crops came up, they would call that part of the summer or part of the hot bit of the year, for want of a better word. Okay, as long as the earth rem remains seed time and harvest, these are important things in their year. These are the harvests throughout the year. We've got the barley harvest, we've got the wheat harvest, we've got the grape harvest. We would think of them as spring, summer, and autumn. 
But the way that they determined the time was by the harvests that would happen through, throughout the year. So it's, it's really weird that people talk of the spring feasts and the fall feasts. <laughs> Those things don't exist in, in the scripture. Okay, so this is how their year would have looked. Or an example of how their year would have looked. The spring equinox marks the chodesh to begin the year. Then you've got the barley harvest. Feast of Unleavened Bread. And again, the barley harvest might have happened at the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. There's not a set timeline for every year. This is an example year. Then you would have the fruit planted. This would have been one of the seed times. Then you'd have the wheat harvest. Then the Feast of Shavuot. Okay, barley takes about 60 to 70 days to grow. Wheat takes about uh, four months to grow. So the barley and the wheat would be planted together, but the barley would come about first. The autumnal equinox, then you'd have trumpets, Yom Kippur again. This equinox could be within these dates, as long as the ingathering happened before the Feast of Sukkot. Then you'd have the fruit harvest. Then you'd have Sukkot. Then you'd have the former rain, and that would prepare the ground for planting. Then you would plant the barley and the wheat. Then you'd have the latter rain. Then you'd have the vernal equinox, marking when everything was going to be a vive. Then you'd have the barley harvest, because that grows first. Then unleavened bread. And you'd have your fruit planted. And this is how their years would look. This is their calendar. We try to make our calendar and like explain our calendar in their terms, or vice versa, explain their calendar in our terms. This is their actual calendar, though. These are the significant parts of the year for them. So just before we come to a close in this part, I'm going to look at the sun. Looking at Yehovah's timepiece as a whole, we need to understand the sun as well. We understand the stars, and we understand that the sun is a part of that. The sun is actually written of quite a lot in Scripture. And the way that it's written of is, um, it shows again that what was... Uh, pertinent to them was it traveling through the constellations. In the second part, we're going to look at the moon. Okay. For now, we'll look at the sun. So the sun will travel through the constellations. And these constellations aren't in uh, order. This is just a graphic. Okay. When the sun goes forth, we'll travel through the first six Chodesh. You've got the, the first Chodesh, that's when you've got the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The sun travels through six Chodesh, then around the time of the equinox, it will start its journey back through the other six Chodeshim, starting with the seventh Chodeshim, which is when Sukkot is. Psalm 19, uh, 1 to 6 says, The heavens are proclaiming the esteem of ale, and the firmament is declaring the work of his hand. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, and there are no words. Their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them, he set up a tent for the sun. So the firmament is wherein the sun dwells. And he is like a bridegroom coming out of his room. It rejoices like a strong man, or he rejoices like a strong man. The word he and it are the same in Hebrew. To run the path. It refers to a path that he's going to run. And we see this all the way through scripture. And we're going to look at this because it's very easy to miss, particularly in our English translations, which have no concept of the fact that the sun goes on a path through the constellations. Its place of going forth is from one end of the heavens, its circuit to the other end. Okay, so we have this language that speaks of the sun traveling on a circuit or going forth and returning, as we'll see. The word for, um, I mean, sometimes it's translated as this, rising. This is the outline of biblical usage. It's not a definition. It's how this particular Bible has used that word. But the word means an act or place of going out uh, or forth from, to issue from, export, the source or the spring of something. You know, talk of things springing up. The place of going forth. Okay, so it's not the place that it rises. It's got nothing to do with it going up in the air. It's not its rising. It's its place of going forth. So the sun goes forth from a place. 
Deuteronomy 11, 11 to 12 says, But the land which you are passing over to possess is a land of hills and valleys which drinks water from the rain of the heavens. A land which Yehovah your Elohim looks after. The eyes of Yehovah your Elohim are always on it. From the beginning of the year to the latter end of the year. And we know the sixth Chodesh, which is the beginning of the year. The latter end of the year is when the sun travels back through the last six Chodesh. But we'll see this uh, throughout the scriptures as we look at them. Now, Exodus 34, 22 in the King James Version says, And thou shalt observe the feast of weeks, Shavuot, of the first fruits of the wheat harvest, and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. Does anyone see a problem with Sukkot being at the end of the year? Okay, it's Sukkot in the seventh Chodesh. It's not in the twelfth Chodesh. It's not at the end of the year. It's in the middle of the year. In the Septuagint version, they get it right. They say, in a holiday of a period of seven, you shall observe to me the beginning of the harvest of wheat and a holiday gathering being in the middle of the year. That's where it is. It's not at the year's end. The Hebrew actually gets it right as well. It's just the King James translators didn't get it right because they didn't have the doctrinal understanding. Okay, this is the Young's literal translation. It says, In the feast of weeks thou dost observe for thyself first fruits of wheat harvest and the feast of ingathering at the revolution of the year, when the year turns. Okay, so you've got it going out through the first six Chodesh, and then you've got this turning in its cycle, and then it begins to come back. And that's when the feast of Sukkot is. Okay, this is the word which is used in the Hebrew. Okay, it's tekufah. Okay, it talks of a revolution, um, or a course, a circuit coming about. This word's used in several different places. But basically what it's talking is the turning of the circuit. Okay? So a better translation would be, perform the festival of weeks for yourself, of the first fruit to the wheat harvest, and the festival of ingathering at the turning of the circuit of the year. You've got the year, the circuit that the sun goes out on. This is the same word when it says the sun goes out on its circuit. Okay? You've got this turning, which is Sukkot, which is it's gone out, it's gone forth through those six Chodesh. Now it's going to turn and come back through the latter six Chodesh. Okay, goes out, comes back in. This is the circuit of the year. And if we've got this understanding, so many other scriptures make sense to us. They use words that we would think were a bit weird. But when we understand this, we can see what they're talking about. Second Chronicles 24 verse 23 uses the word tekufa as well. It came to be at the turning of the circuit of the year. Okay, so we know when that is, when the sun's gone out to its midway point. Deuteronomy 33, 13 to 14 says, And of Yosef, he said, Blessed of Yehovah is his land, with the choicest from the heavens, and with the dew, and the deep lying beneath. With the choice fruits of the sun, and the choice yield of the months. That's a bit of a weird thing, isn't it, to be compared with the choice yields of the sun and the choice yield of the months? It doesn't make much sense. Okay, this is what the Young's literal translation says says, by the precious things, fruits of the sun, by precious things cast forth by the moons. It doesn't say months. It doesn't say chudashim there. It says yeriachim, which is moons. Okay, the fruits of the sun, and that cast forth by the moons. So I looked it up in the Septuagint version to see what it said there. And what it said there is very, very interesting. We've got this tekufa, which talks about the circuit of the sun. In the Septuagint it says, and according to the season of the offsprings of the son of the circuits and the returns of the months. Okay, and we know that's actually moons. Okay, the son of the circuits and the returns of the moons. Something interesting is that it's not just the sun that goes through the constellations, it's also the moon. The moon travels through the constellations as well. Every two or three days it travels to another constellation. But for now, what I want to look at is the sun of the circuits. Because I could look this up in the interlinear Septuagint and find the word for the circuits there. Once I had that word, I could look for that in the Septuagint and also in the New Testament. It only appears once in the New Testament. It's this word, tropa. Okay, and this is what it means, a turning, i.e. a turning of the heavenly bodies. Okay, a tropa. This is where it occurs in uh, the New Testament. 
Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights. Well, that phrase was always a little bit weird to me. I was like, the Father of lights? I can kind of understand what it's talking about. These are the lights that it's talking about. Elohim said lights come to be, and Elohim made two great lights, and he also made the stars. He is the Father of the lights in the heavens. Then we get the word tropa. Okay, father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning, which is a bit of a bizarre phrase for us as well. But what it's talking about is the turning of these things, is the turning of the lights that he's the father of. So it only appears that once in the New Testament. Include that because I thought it was interesting. When we see it in the Septuagint, though, it gives us uh, even better Im- information. Do you remember the word Maseroth before? It's used in Job to talk about the 12 constellations. Okay, well now we've got the circuit of the sun linked with the Maserat. Job 38, 32 to 33. Or will you open Maseroth in its time? And Hesperus with its tail, will you lead it? And do you know the circuits of the heavens? Circuits of the heavens, the Maseroth. Okay, this is what it's talking about. Okay, in the ISR version, the scriptures version, uh, it says, and perform the festival of weeks for yourself, or the first fruits of wheat harvest and the festival of, in- of ingathering. It doesn't actually say this. It says at the turn of the year in the scriptures version. This is a better translation. In the King James Version, we get another end of the year spoken of. Okay, so we saw the end of the year. It doesn't say that. It says the tekufah of the year, the revolution, the turning of the course of the year. This is a different verse, though, and it uses a different word. The feast of harvest, the the first fruits of thy labors, which thou hast sown in the field, and the feast of ingathering, which is in the end of the year. So when I saw this, I thought, well, it's just going to be the word tekufar, isn't it? It's not the end of the year. Not actually true. The Young's literal translation calls it the outgoing of the year. Remember, if we think of the sun going through the sixth chodesh, Okay, and then the outgoing of the year is when the year is coming to an end and it's going to come into the new year when we'll have those renewals and it will go through the constellations anew. Okay, so the ISR says at the outgoing of the year as well. That's a, that's a fairly good translation. The word is yatsa, yatsa. It means to go out, come out, exit, or to go forth. To go out of, basically. So it's kind of like the exit of the year. We've got the sun going out through the sixth, and then it making exit into the new year. And that's where the renewals come from. Okay, in the Septuagint version, it says at the conclusion of the year. A bit weird, kind of end of the year. But if we look at the actual Greek word used, it's exodos. Okay, and we know what the exodus is. Okay, exodus is an exit or a departure. So we've got Sun going out, then the sun, the latter half of the year, referred to as the sun departing from the year, basically. 2 Samuel 11 verse 1 says, And it came to be at the turn of the year. Okay, this isn't the tekufar of the year. This is another word which shows us again that they're referring to this cycle of the sun going out and returning. This word should be familiar to us. This word is teshuvah. Okay, Teshuvah, we think of as meaning repentance. It's only actually used eight times in the entirety of the scriptures. It comes from the word shuv, but it means to return. Okay, the completion of a year, return of a year, but that's how they saw it. The sun would go out and then the sun would make Teshuvah and it would return. So it came to be at the return of the year. And again, we know when these things are. They're referring to these cycles all the way through. It's just really easy to miss unless you're taking it apart and you're looking at the words that are used and you've got that understanding to make sense of the words that are used. 1 Kings 20.22 says, again, and know and see what you should do for at the return of the year, the king of Aram is coming up against you. And later in verse 26, it says, and it came to be at the return of the year, at the Teshuvah of the year, the Ben-Hadad mustered the Arameans and went up to a fake uh, to fight against Yisrael. <laughs> First Chronicles 20 verse one makes reference to it again. Okay, these things are literally all throughout the scriptures. 
Second Chronicles 36.10 And at the return of the year, Nebuchadnezzar sent and brought him to Babel. Okay, so very simply, sun goes forth, then it returns. The sun makes Teshuvah and it comes back. And these things, all the way throughout the scriptures, and it's explained because the circuit is through the Maseroth, the constellations. That is the sun's part in Yehovah's timepiece. We'll come back in the second part and we'll understand the moon. Okay. Okay, so this is the part that I think that everybody wants to see. Because there's the verse, isn't there? The moon is from Moedim. So how does that work? That's probably the most common question that I was asked. I only really got the fullness of the answer on Tuesday when I sat down for the second time. Most of this came on Tuesday. A little tiny, tiny piece of it came on uh, the day when I was talking about the, uh, the science from Yehovah. Um, he showed me something about the equinox, but I'll, sh I'll show you that. Okay, so Job 3.6 says, That night, let darkness seize it. Let it not be included among the days of the year. Let it not come into the number of the months. Now, commonly the word for moon is translated as month. But it doesn't mean month. All it is is the tradition. When a moon is used, it must be talking about the month because the people used the, month, uh, the moon for months back then. So they just put month in instead. But in the Hebrew, we've got it here. Months is Yerach. And Yerach does not ever mean month. Doesn't mean the same thing as Chudashim. And I think people, because of the way uh, Chudashim and Yerach are used in conjunction with each other sometimes, I think people kind of get uh, confused about that. But I'll be going through that as well. Okay, so into the number of Yerach. And here, you can see it, it's Yerach. Im, that's the plural, Yerachim. So it's not, mon it's not moon, it's moons. Okay, this is what the word Yerach actually means, moon. And by association, the biblical usage is sometimes month. So some translations will sometimes say month, but that's not what the word means, never what it means. What it means uh, a better word for it, I like this word, is lunation. Okay, and a lunation is from when you've got the new moon, okay, and it's all darkness, and you go through to a full moon, and then the moon waxes. That's referred to as a lunation, and it's a period of 29.53 days. So what it should say is, that night let darkness seize it, let it not be included among the days of the year, let it not come into the number of moons. Okay, and we see one usage of the moons here. Moon is what rules over the night. So you've got days of the year, and then you've got moons. And moons is just used to mean nights sometimes, the number of moons, the number of days, the number of moons. Okay, that night, let darkness seize it. Let it not be included among the days of the year. Let it not come into the number of moons. It makes a lot more sense, doesn't it? The number of months. Job 7.3 says, So am I allotted months of futility and nights of trouble. Hebrew parallelism, when you say two things in the same, uh, two things, one thing, in two different ways, rather. Moons of futility, nights of trouble. Okay, they're the same thing. A moon of futility is the same as a night of trouble. So sometimes when it talks about moons, it's talking about nights. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. Isaiah 60 verse 20, we see um, when Yerach is translated as moon, and it couldn't be translated this month. No longer does your sun go down, nor your moon withdraw itself. So it's obvious what this word means. Okay? People want to go through the references for Yara, Yareach is how it's pronounced. Uh, these are them, and if you go through them, you'll see, if you just plug moon in, every time it's mistranslated it as month, they all make so much more sense. Exodus 2, 1 to 2 says, And a man of the house of Levi went and married the daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bore a son, and she saw that he was a lovely child. And she hid him three moons. Okay, it says three months in most translations, but it's not three chodeshim. And Moses, 
Moshe knew how to say three chudashim. He says it in Genesis thirty-eight twenty-four, and it came to be about three chudashim after the Yahuvah, uh, Yahuda was informed. So he knew how to say chudesh, obviously from all the rest of Torah he knows as well. But because we've got English translations and they go on these traditions of these things, we miss so much information. She hid him for three moons. Now that three moons could either be three nights or it could have been three lunations. It could have been the entire period. You see that Yahuvah refers to uh, moons in, in that sense. We'll see that as we go through. So Deuteronomy 21, 10 to 13 says, When you go out to fight against your enemies, and Yahuwah your Elohim shall give them into your hand, and you shall take them captive, you shall see among the, and you shall see among the captives a woman fair of form, and shall delight in her, and take her for your wife. Then you shall bring her home to your house, and she shall shave her head and trim her nails, put aside the mantle of her captivity, dwell in your house, mourn her father and her mother, a moon of days. Okay? Not a month of days, a moon of days. Because a moon is another way to reckon time. It's part of his timepiece. Okay? The sun and the stars gives us the chotashim. The moons are distinct periods of time. And they are uh, things that Yehovah refers to all throughout the scripture. Sometimes it's a moon as a period of time. Sometimes it'll be a chotashim. But they're always different. Second Kings 15.13 says, Shalom, son of Yavesh began to reign in the 39th year of Uzziah, the king of Yehuda. He reigned a moon of days. Okay, so often you'll get this. It'll be a moon of days. Sometimes a moon is a night, but a moon of days is a lunation. Job 3 verse 6. Okay, the one that we looked at. That night let darkness seize it. Let it not be included among the days of the year. Let it not come into the number of moons. So that's different. A moon of days and the number of moons in this context, they're different. One's a night, one's a lunation. So am I allotted moons of futility, nights of trouble. Again, this is the nighttime version of it. Oh, that I were as in moons past. We've got a saying, haven't we? Many moons ago. Okay, so it's, it's familiar to us, this reckoning of time by moons. But they're not the same as the Chodeshim. Okay, so, oh, that I were as in moons past, as in the days when the lower protected me. Do you know the time when the wild mountain uh, goats bear young? Or do you observe when the deer gives birth? This is Yehovah replying to Job. Okay, he says, do you know about these things? And then he says... Do you number the moons they complete? So Yehovah uses these things as a reckoning of time. Obviously, I mean, he gave us that giant timepiece in the sky so that we could reckon time differently. Ashley's doing something at the moment. She's compiling data over the past 50 years. So it's going to take a while until we've got it. Okay. But she is putting uh, the moons, the phases of the moon on each day. And then the Chodeshim over them if, as they've been and the feast days to see if we can find any correspondence between the two. It's not important for, for this. I mean, as long as we understand what the moons are for, we can find greater significance later. But a moon is a different period of time to a Chodesh and they are used differently in the scriptures. Then I sent off the three, this is Yehovah speaking again. Then I sent off the three shepherds in one moon, in one night. Okay, so he uses both reckoning of time when he is um, speaking directly. First Kings six thirty seven to thirty eight says, In the fourth year the foundation of the house of Yehovah was laid in the month Ziv, that's what the English says. And in the eleventh year in the month Bool, the eighth month, the house was completed in all its matters and according to its plans. Thus he built it for seven years. And from verses such as this, people get confused. And they think that these, ter these terms are used interchangeably. But they're not. Let's look at the Hebrew. In the fourth year was the foundation of the house of Yehovah laid in the month. But it's Yerach. So it's not Chodeshim. It is moon. In the moon, Ziv. The next verse says, And in the eleventh year, in the moon, Bool, which is the eighth Chodesh. Oh, wait there. Is that saying that it's the, the moon bull is the eighth Chodesh? Is this proof positive that the months are determined by the moon? It's not. If all that you had was a blue letter Bible 
app or whatever, or whatever, whatever it was, then you, you'd miss what the Hebrew actually says. We need to understand what the Hebrew is saying here. Okay, so this is the Hebrew of the verse. This word here is b'yirach. Okay, it's a bait and then the word yirach. And when you have a bait before a word, it means in that word. So we'll start off here, in moon. The next word here is bool. Okay, in moon bool. Then you've got this word here, which is who. And who in Hebrew means he. I've had it. I've heard it said before that the way that you remember he and she in Hebrew is who is he and he is she, which is quite confusing. Okay, who means he? He means she. Well, the word who means he or it. The next word here is uh, ha chodesh, the month. Ha shmini. Okay, ha means the. And you would have it before both words of a phrase. So you'd have ha chodesh ha shmini, which is the third month. The month shmini. Oh, sorry, the eighth month. Shmini means eighth. So what, is, what we've got when we put it together is in moon bull, he, eighth month. What we've got here is Hebrew in what's called the construct state, where you've got forms of nouns that are next to each other. There's no such word as of in Hebrew. You will never find it in a Hebrew passage. Maybe in modern Hebrew, I'm not sure. Certainly not in ancient Hebrew. So the way that we get the word of is when things exist in the construct state. Then the word of is implied. So what it actually says is, in moon bool, he of the eighth month, which is completely different. It doesn't say which is the eighth month. It says that month bool is the month, is the moon of the eighth month. Because something that we've lost culturally is that months or chudashim have moons associated with them as well. Why do full moons have names? I took this from an article. The early Native Americans didn't record time using months of the Julian or Gregorian calendar. Instead, tribes g uh, gave each full moon a nickname to keep track of the seasons and lunar months. Just as an aside, I'll address something. The Julian and Gregorian calendars. People say, why do we use uh, the days of the Julian and Gregorian calendar when we're trying to work out the uh, biblical calendar? Okay, that's, um, that's just a misconception. If you've got a seven-day week, it doesn't matter what calendar you're going from, one period of time on one seven-day calendar is going to equal a period of time on the other seven-day calendar. The biblical calendar is seven days. So if we take any seven-day calendar, that's going to correspond to the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth day, and Shabbat is always going to correspond with a day on another calendar. It doesn't mean that we're taking the Shabbat from that other calendar. It just means that we're using the seven-day calendar. Okay, so the early Native Americans, if anyone's ever tried to look at the um, at the tribes spreading out across the world, they'll know that um, there is evidence that the Native Americans came from the Hebrews. Okay, So they gave each full moon a nickname to keep track of the seasons and lunar months. Most of the names relate to an activity or an event which took place at that time in each location. However, it wasn't a uniform system. Tribes tended to name and count moons differently. Some, for example, counted four seasons a year, while others counted five. Others defined the year as 12 moons, while others said they were 13. Which is, you know, we get this wacky system, don't we? Of, oh, yep, there's 12 months in a year on the calendar that we follow, and then sometimes we add in the 13th month here, and that's nonsense. But some had 12, some had 13. Colonial Americans adopted some of the moon names and applied them to their own calendar system, which is why they're still in existence today, according to the Farmer's, farmer's Almanac. So the moon names. January is Wolf Moon. Okay, so you could say, Wolf Moon, he of the month January, which is what the Hebrew says. Okay, month bull, he of the eighth chodesh. This moon was named because villagers used to hear packs of wolves howling in hunger around this time of year. So the name is Old Moon. Snow Moon in February, named because it's the snowish month in America. Traditionally also referred to as Hunger Moon because hunting was difficult when it was snowy. 
Worm moon, as temperatures warm, earthworm casts begin to appear and birds begin finding food. It's also known as sap moon, crow moon, and lenten moon. Pink moon, known as the pink moon after the pink wildflowers which appear in the US and Canada in early spring. This moon is also known as egg moon due to the spring egg laying season. Some coastal tribes refer to it as fish moon because it appeared at the same time as the shad swimming upstream. Flower moon, now this one's gonna be significant. You're gonna need to remember something about this. Spring has officially sprung by the time May arrives. The flowers and colourful blooms dot the landscape. This moon is also known as corn planting moon as crops are sown in time for harvest or bright moon. Okay, hold on to this piece of information. This moon happens in May and it's called bright moon because this full moon is known to be one of the brightest. Some people refer to it as milk moon. Okay, June, we've got strawberry moon because it's the beginning of strawberry picking season. Okay, this moon appears in the same month as the summer solstice, the longest day of the year at 17 hours of daylight. So basically what we need to take away from this is that a chodesh would have a moon. So when you say month or moon bull, he of the eighth chodesh, it makes perfect sense according to what we know right now. Not doesn't mean that the uh, words are used interchangeably. July thunder moon, named due to the prevalence of summer thunderstorms, it's sometimes referred to as the full book moon because at this time of year, book's antlers have fully grown. Sturgeon moon in August, uh, tribes in North America typically caught sturgeon during this month, but also it's when the grain and corn were gathered, so it's also referred to as grain moon. September, the harvest moon. Now this is significant, this harvest moon. The harvest moon is, given the is the name given to the first full moon that takes place closest to the, auto the autumnal equinox. Okay, so that's called the harvest moon. And that is another witness with the equinox about the crops getting ripe. It was during September that most of the crops were harvested ahead of the autumn, and this moon would give light to farmers so they could carry on working longer in the evening, also called barley moon, full corn moon, or fruit moon. Hunter's moon in October, as people planned for the cold months, the October moon came to signify the ideal time for hunting game, which were becoming fatter from eating fallen grains. This month is also known as the travel moon and dying grass moon. Worth bearing in mind this as well, the October moon. Okay, it's when the animals were becoming uh, fatter because of eating the fallen grains. Okay, November frost moon. First uh, of the winter frost historically begins around now in the US. Winter begins to bite, leading to this month's moon moniker. It's also known as the beaver moon. December cold moon, lights are long and dark. Winter's grip tightens, hence this moon's name. Okay, so absolutely something that we're familiar with, having a month in a certain chodesh. Then we come to month, uh, sorry, to moon ziv. Okay, the moon of ziv. And ziv means brightness. Okay, anyone remember what month bright moon was in? Oh, what do you know? <laughs> we still call it the same thing today. Okay, bull. Bull means increase of produce, and that's October and November. That's when the animals were getting fatter. Okay, it's also right after they would have brought in all of the crops. So you can see why they would have named these moons certain things according to what was going on in the land at the time. Nothing strange here at all. Doesn't mean that uh, Chodesh has anything to do with the moon. Doesn't mean the terms are used interchangeably. First Kings 6 verse 1 says, And it came to be in the 480th year after the children of Israel had come out of the land of Mitraim, in the fourth year of the reign of Shlomo over Israel, in the Chodesh of Ziv, he of the second Chodesh. The Chodesh of Ziv? I thought Ziv was a moon. It is a moon. Okay? Like we would say, the moon of May, the bright moon. So in the Chodesh of the bright moon, he of the second Chodesh. The second Chodesh is what the Chodesh is, but it's also the Chodesh in which we have the moon, Ziv. So it's called the Chodesh of Ziv. It's the Chodesh in which Ziv happens, and then we have the Chodesh uh, here. doesn't mean that the terms are used interchangeably. shouldn't cause us any confusion. Ziv, he of the second Chodesh. That's the clue. He of the second Chodesh, or it of the second Chodesh, if you like. Okay, so the Hebrew of this verse shows us that month is Chodesh, 
and it's Ziv. Okay, these are tools that are available to anyone. If they want to take the word month and you want to see what it absolutely says, go on blueletterbible.org and you can do it there. But as I said, the month, the Chodesh of Ziv, isn't a problem for us. It is the Chodesh in which Ziv occurs. And Ziv is he of the second Chodesh, which is the Chodesh which is referred to. Okay, so in the Chodesh of Ziv, he of the second Chodesh. Okay, simple enough to understand. First Kings 8.2 says, And all the men of Yisrael assembled to Shlomo at the festival in the month, and sorry, in the moon of Eithanim. Okay, people think that Eithanim is the name of the seventh Chodesh. Not what it says. It says the moon of Eithanim is he of the seventh Chodesh. And Eithanim means enduring. So we might call it enduring moon. It's what they called it. Esther 3 7. Not only are the Yerach, the Yerachim, called by a name, sometimes the Chodesh is called by a name as well. This kind of came about after they came out of Babylon. Very interesting what these words mean. Okay, the Chodesh of Nisan. Well, we know that Yehovah called it the Chodesh of Aviv. So, the Chodesh of Nisan, why would that be after they've come from a foreign land? Well, Nisan means their flight. Okay, what happened in the month of Aviv? Passover, the Exodus. It's the month of their flight. That's why it's called so. Well, that's why I think it's called so. It would make perfect sense for it to be. The Chodesh of Sivan. Okay, Sivan means their covering, the Chodesh of their covering. Esther 2.16 makes reference to the Chodesh of Tevaith. Tevaith means goodness. Okay? Zechariah 1 verse 7 says, On the 24th day of the 11th Chodesh, which is the Chodesh of Shabbat. So after a certain period of time, they started naming the Chodesh. They also named their moons. Well, when we can differentiate those two things, we can see an awful lot more depth in Scripture as to what it's actually saying. Shivat and Shivat means a rod. Zechariah 7.1 is a little bit different. It says, In the fourth year of King Dariavesh, that's Darius, if you want to say his name wrong, it came to be that the word of Yahuwah came to Zechariah on the fourth of the ninth Chodesh, Kislev. That makes you think that the Ninth Chodesh is Kislev, or Kislev. Okay. Not what it says in the Hebrew. It came to pass in the fourth year of King Darius that the word of, the, of Yehovah came unto Zechariah in the fourth day of the ninth month, ninth Chodesh. And then it says in the King James translation, even in Kislev. Even in Kislev. Hey, why would it say even in Kislev? Well, if we look here, we've got the word kislev here, but it's berkislev. So what it actually says is, in the fourth year of King Dariavesh, it came to be that the word of Yehovah came to Zechariah on the fourth of the ninth Chodesh in kislev. Much more likely that kislev is just a place where the word of Yehovah came to him, not the name of the month. It's actually unimportant for the calendar teaching. It's just as I was going through, I was discovering these things about names. I thought, it's interesting, I'll share it. So 1 Kings 6.38 In the eleventh year, in the moon bull, he of the eighth Chodesh, the house was completed in all its matters. So what we see here is that they were reckoning things by both the Chodesh and also by the moons, by the Yeriachim. Okay, so these things were given for signs and for Moedim and for days and for years. Okay, so the moon for signs. The moon does give us signs. I'm not saying that there's any uh, relevance to these things, we will see when Ashley's uh, compiled all of the data whether these things show anything or whether we can discern that they show anything. But the moon does do some weird things. Okay, we've got full moons, everyone's aware of what a full moon is. Then, then we've got a harvest moon, and that's the full moon that's closest to the autumn equinox. Okay, so they would have reckoned the moon um, as relevant to the Moedim. That's not what the moon is for Moedim means, but it's one of the things that it could mean. Black moon. Okay, most experts agree this refers to a second new moon in a calendar month because you've got the Chodesh, 
and the Chodesh could be 31 days long. The moon cycle is 29.53 days, then in some Chodesh, you're going to have a new moon at the beginning of it, and then a new moon at the end of it. And that's called the black moon. Something we'll be familiar with is a blue moon. Are you wanting a blue moon? That's a phenomenon that occurs when there's a second full moon in one calendar month. So we've got black moons and we've got blue moons. And I don't know what they mean, but I know that they do give signs to the people who are on Earth. So we get to this verse. He made the moon from Moedim. Made the moon for appointed times. This is the one where everyone's like, it's, it's, not, it's not the sun and the stars that give us the Chodeshim and tell us where the feasts start, because he gave the moon for appointed times. Okay. On a very simplistic level, if we continue reading through Psalm 104, then we can see what this is making reference to. Verse 20. You put darkness and it is night. In it all the beasts of the forest creep. The young lions are roaring for prey and seeking their food from ale. The sun arises, they withdraw, lie down in their dens. Man goes out to his work and to his labor till evening. So we've got the passage of a day there. Okay, we've got the night time. Then the night passes and the things that happen in the night pass. Then the sun arises, those things withdraw, those animals withdraw. And then man goes forth uh, to his work. And he goes to his labor until evening when you'll get another moon. So very simply, the appointed times being shown to us by the moon, because the moon rules over the night, and we have to have day and night to know the passage of days, to know what day of the month it is, the moon is given to us for appointed times in that way. Some of the appointed times are more than one day as well. So how do you know when you've been there for seven or eight days? Well, you know by the moon. The moon is given to us for appointed times. So very simplistically, what this is saying, and we can see that from the way that it's followed in the passage. However, there is something um, that is significant in it as well. This is in the NASB translation. And it's interesting. He made the moon for the Moedim. The sun knows the place of its setting, is what it says in the NASB. Not really what it says in the Hebrew. In the Hebrew, it's closer to what we see in the King James. This is from the Book of Enoch. When I include the Book of Enoch, I'm not saying the Book of Enoch is inspired. I'm not saying that it's good for anything other than to see the sort of things that they were paying attention to when the Book of Enoch was written. I'm going to make reference later as well to the Dead Sea Scrolls to see what sort of thing in the heavens they were paying attention to. We see from the Book of Enoch that they were paying attention to when the moon set. Okay? We've got the sun going forth and setting. We've got the moon going forth and setting as well. I didn't even know that the moon set until uh, recently. The moon does set. It says in the book of Enoch, and in certain months, certain Chodeshim, she alters her setting, and in certain Chodeshim, she pursues her own peculiar course. In two Chodeshim, the moon sets with the sun in those two middle portals, the third and the fourth. Previous to this, he has made reference to the fact that the sky is divided up into six gates, is what the person who wrote this is referring to. Six gates. That, these are the third and the fourth of those, these areas of the sky. She goes forth for seven days and turns about and returns again through the portal where the sun rises. I wonder if this is the word Teshuvah. I do not have the Hebrew of the book of Enoch to check but we can see these cycles spoken of. And accomplishes all her light. And she recedes from the sun. And in eight days, she enters the sixth portal from which the sun goes out. And when the sun goes forth from the fourth portal, she goes forth seven days until she goes forth from the fifth and turns back again in seven days into the fourth portal and accomplishes all her light. She recedes and enters into the first portal in eight days. She returns again in seven days into the fourth portal from which the sun goes forth. Thus I saw their position, how the moon rose and the sun set in those days. So I include this so that we know that they were paying attention to when the sun rose, the moon rose, and when the moon set, and the sun set. I couldn't confirm this until the day of the equinox, or it turns out I could have if I just used this software. This was sent to me by a guy called Chris in Georgia, and he had set up something so that he could track, track the equinox. I said to him, if you're looking at these things on this day, could you please tell me whether the sun sets and the moon sets in the same place on the equinox? 
This is one of the pieces of information that I was given when I was going through the um, Science from Yehovah teaching. The moon sets and the sun sets in the same place on the equinox. Okay, and it's only on the equinox. So this is the path of the sun on that day that Chris sent to me. This is the path of the moon on the same day. Okay, so we've got the moon is for appointed times. The moon is for Moedim. The sun knows the place of its setting. That's the relevant part of the verse which nobody reads. Okay, the sun knows the place of its setting, or the sun knows it's going down, as we'll see in the King James Version. That's really what it, that's a better translation, but in it, his going down, or it's going down, same word for his and its. It's talking about this place where it sets. The sun knows the place of its setting. This is the uh, equipment that Chris had set up, that he'd made himself. So everybody can track when the equinox is. Okay, and everybody can look at the sky and know where the sun's setting and where the moon's setting. And all of these things would have been very familiar to these people who lived outside and were watching this giant clock in the sky. We have to now kind of reverse engineer things and rediscover these things. But to them, they just looked up and they're like, oh yeah, look, the, the sun and the moon are doing that thing that they do on the equinox. So the moon is for appointed times in various different ways. That's no kind of problem for this calendar. Okay, again, if you object to the science, just take the effect which is being spoken of, the observable effect. The moon's orbital motion combined with the larger orbit of the Earth around the sun carries it farther eastward among the constellations of the zodiac from night to night. At any one moonrise, the moon occupies a particular place on the celestial sphere, the great dome of the heavens. But when the Earth turns towards the point 24 hours later, the moon has moved off to the east, about 12 degrees, and it takes an average of 50 minutes longer for the Earth to rotate toward the moon and for the moon thus to rise. Think of it as a giant slinky in which each loop, representing one lunar orbit of the Earth, advances the orbit a bit farther along the spiral path. So these things change, come into, um, come into uh, being together on that night, the night of the equinox. But around the date of the harvest moon, the moon rises about the same time. So it's this harvest moon again that's around the autumnal equinox. Around the, but around the date of the harvest moon, the moon rises about the same time. This is another sign that the moon gives us. It rises about the same time. Why? Remember that the zodiac is the band of constellations through which the moon travels from night to night. So it takes the sun, a chodeshim, to go through them. It takes the moon two or three uh, days or nights. The section of the zodiac band in which the full moon travels around the start of autumn is the section that forms the most shallow angle with the eastern horizon. Because the moon's orbit on successive nights is more nearly parallel to the horizon at that time, its relationship to the eastern horizon does not change appreciably and the earth does not have to turn as far as to bring up the moon. So this is why the moon and the sun are coming up on the harvest moon. The moon may rise as little as 23 minutes later on several nights before and after the full harvest moon at about 42 degrees north latitude, which means extra light at the peak harvest time near autumn. By the time the moon has reached the last quarter, however, the typical 50 minute delay has returned. Okay, so this is given to us absolutely for science so that we can know when these things are happening. And it's, it's only difficult for us to understand because we live in houses and we never look at the sky at the in the night time really. At the start of spring, the opposite applies. The full moon is in the section of the zodiac that has the steepest angle with respect to the eastern horizon. For several days bracketing the full moon nearest the vernal equinox, the delay in moonrise is as much as 75 minutes at 42 degrees north latitude. Okay. Now using the moon for Chodeshim had to come from somewhere. Okay, and the place that it actually comes from is from Babylon. We know that Babylon used the moon to determine what a month is. Or what they would call a month was what we would call a moon, what scripture calls a moon. Okay, Babylon had the pagan priesthood which spread into Assyria so that the border between Babylon and Assyria was somewhat artificial to their priesthood. It didn't really mean much to them. 
Before Babylon conquered Assyria's capital city Nineveh in 612 BCE, this priesthood performed their nightly observations of the heavens and made their first forays at mathematical astronomy. The kings of Assyria recognized the supposed powers of this priesthood and received letters from them. Okay, and we still have those letters. So this is letter number 303. On the 30th, I saw the moon. It was in a high position for the 30th day. Presently, it will be as high as it stands on the second day. If agreeable to the king, my lord, let the king wait for, for a report. Let the king wait, meaning for a report, from the city of Ashur. The king, my lord, may then determine for us the first day of the month. So this whole thing about the sighted moon, this is where it comes from. These are the people who were doing it. They went into Babylon and then suddenly... Their, um, their language changed for certain things. Okay, we see in Ezra 6.15 it says, And this house was completed on the third day of the moon of Adar. This is significant because this is a transliteration in the Hebrew of a Babylonian month name or a Babylonian moon name. So we can see where they got the name of this particular moon from. This was after they came out of Babylon, which is Ezra, Nehemiah were the times that they came out. And we also see it in Nehemiah. Okay, so Adar means glorious. I really know what that means. I thought I'd share the information as I was going through it. In Nehemiah 6.15, it says, The war was completed on the 25th of Elul, which is another Hebrew transliteration of a Babylonian moon name. These things came from Babylon. And Elul means nothingness. Okay, which doesn't really sound like a name that Yahuwah gives to his moons, but it does kind of sound like the sort of thing that a nihilistic sort of culture would. Babylon, the, the moon of nothingness. Okay, this is where it comes from. We know for a fact that it was the name of the Babylonian moon, and they are just making the best that they can effort of using a Hebrew transliteration to refer to that moon. So they came from Babylon. Next thing that I want to look at, the moon's phases in scripture. Because something that stood out before I knew any of this was that the moon had phases. So what's the significance of the moon? I thought, probably the phases of the moon. The moon phases are mentioned in scripture, but it's not quite as significant as we would have perhaps thought. Proverbs seven eighteen to 21 says, Come, let us take our fill of love until morning. Let us delight ourselves with love. For my husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. He took a bag of silver with him. He comes home on the day of the new moon, it says. Okay, but it's not Chodesh here. With her many words, she leads him astray. With her smooth lips, she seduces him. So let's look at this passage. Okay. The words translated as new moon are translated in the King James Version as full moon. And it is keser. This is a very, very strange word though. And I'll show you why it's relevant to our conversation on the calendar. Here we see it, ha keser. Looks like the word is used twice here. It's not keser, it's just full and moon. Which is why you've got it twice here but only once there. Doesn't mean full moon though. Okay, keser, full moon. That's what some people think that this word means. Jesenius, though, said, the etymology is not clear to me, for it is not satisfactory to say that it is so-called from the whole moon being covered with light. Okay, so the word, which is its root word, is kasa, and it means to cover, conceal, or hide. So he says, the etymology is not clear to me. It's not satisfactory to say that the whole moon is covered with light. Verbs of covering are often applied in the sense of hiding and covering over, but never as far as I know to mean covered in light. We could kind of fudge that in the English and say, oh, it's covered in light. That's not what the verbs mean. It means that it's covered, it's obscured. Okay, this is from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay, this is what they thought about the phases of the moon. And the reason that I include this, again, isn't to say the Dead Sea Scrolls has got anything going on. There's lots of error that I've found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's not like an accurate, inspired picture of what was going on. This just tells us about their observations of the sky. Okay, and this is what they say. 
The system that he uses to describe the moon, this is talking about this piece of writing about the phases of the moon, it says the system he uses to describe the moon may strike the reader as peculiar. It's really not so much peculiar as theological, certainly biblical in the eyes of its adherence. The writer conceives of the lunar month in, term, in terms of the moon being obscured or revealed. So when we've got the kesser, and it's from this root word which means to cover, it's very much in line with the way that this guy um, interpreted these things. So the full moon, not covered with light, maybe it's talking in these terms of it being obscured or fully covered over. But this is a difficult word to translate. The scripture that people will bring up is blow up the trumpet in the new moon or in the full moon on our solemn feast day. And what they'll say is, look, it is by the moon. It's got to be by the moon. There's only one day that you're blowing trumpets on a new moon. It's the Feast of Trumpets. And then by the time it's the full moon, it's a coat. No. If you go by the new moon as the start of the month and you're saying that marks trumpets, then 14 days later isn't Sukkot. It doesn't really work on that basis, but it doesn't work linguistically. Okay. Psalm 81 verse 3 in the ISR version says, Trump during the Chodesh, a trump in the well-marked day of your holiday, because this word is not really clear what it means, but the word for new moon is Chodesh. It doesn't say anything about the, the moon being new. It doesn't say anything about that being the phase of the moon. It says trump in the Chodesh, which is the instructions that we saw before in your Roshim Chodeshim, the beginning of your months, they were to blow trumpets. So this is what that's a re reference to. But we'll keep on with the word Keser. Okay, so we've got the word here translated in the King James Version, in the time appointed. Certainly doesn't mean anything to do with times or being appointed. But it's this word, keser, again. In Job 26, verse 9, it uses this word. It says, he covers the face of the full moon. He covers the face of the full moon. Okay? See the word being used there, full moon? Doesn't mean full moon. Maybe something to do with it being obscured. We're really not sure. Here it is in the Hebrew. Again, it doesn't appear twice. It appears once. Full moon, same word. In the ISR version, though, it says covering the surface of his throne. Full moon, throne? What's the relation between those two things? The Young's literal translation says taking hold of the face of the throne. So it's not the full moon here. So you see that there's translational difficulties with this word. Okay, there's another word as well. We've got keser, which is this full moon or covered moon as it's been interpreted even though it says nothing about moon it's just something to do with something being covered and then we've got this word as well which is very very close to it which is kiseh and kiseh means seat of honor the throne seat stool seat of honor throne royal dignity authority power and it's from the same root word so i'm going to suggest a different translation of uh, the verse that people think causes problems. Blow up the trumpet in the Chodesh in authority on our solemn feast day. Blow up the trumpet in the Chodesh in power on our solemn feast day. Could mean both of those things. I'm not saying that. I think that it means both of these things. What I'm saying is we don't know what that word means. We know what this one means. So it's got nothing to do with the feast of trumpets being on the new moon or anything like that. Important to cover that though because... Uh, people will have certain verses in the back of their heads and unless I cover all of them and all of the things that they're thinking, they'll hold on to that one tiny thing. Isaiah 30, 23 to 26 gives us another word for moon. It says, And he shall give the rain for your seed uh, with which you sow the ground and bread of the increase of the earth and it shall be fat and rich, your cattle grazing in an enlarged pasture, pasture on that day. And the oxen and the young donkeys that work the ground eat seasoned fodder, winnowed with shovel and fan. And on every high mountain, on every high hill, there shall be rivers and streams, waters in the day of the great slaughter when the towers fall. And the light of the moon shall be as the light of the sun. Okay, so we've got it contrasted with the sun here. Whatever this word is, it's contrasted with the sun. So certainly suggests that it's moon. The word is levanah. Okay, and the word levan means white. 
Okay? Levana is some kind of reference to its whiteness or its brightness. Song of Songs 6 verse 10 says, Who is she who shines forth as the morning, fair as the Levana? So what I'm going to suggest is that this is the full moon. Okay? When the moon is bright, when it is white in the sky. Okay? We've got one reference to it being covered, and we've got one reference to it being white. So if we want to look for the phases of the moon in it, doesn't seem to be where people are looking for them. But I'll suggest this. It's not important to the calendar and the reckoning of time that Yehovah has. It's just suggestions. Okay, so in conclusion, what we've seen is that Yehovah has given us a giant timepiece in the sky. He's given us the Chodeshim, which seem fixed in the sky. And that the sun goes through the Chodeshim, and that gives us the Chodeshim, the months. The moon goes through the Chodeshim, and that gives us different things. The sun and the moon rising at the same time, or them setting in the same part of the sky. It's all important for the reckoning of these things. It's all right there in scripture, but there's no kind of problems that people have suggested with this at all. All it actually does is refine it and give us uh, a better, better understanding of it when we investigate these things. So the sun and the moon go through the Chodeshim, and it speaks of them going forth, and it speaks of them returning as well. And this is the calendar of Yah. He's given us it right there. All that we actually needed to do all along was look up at the sky and say, what's actually happening here? Because he's already told us that it's our way of reckoning these things. Okay? So, I think that we should pray and thank Yehovah. This is nothing to do with me. This isn't JP's calendar. As, as I said, I sat down at the beginning of the week. I didn't have any of this in place. And he just laid it out for me. Father, I thank you that you've, um, that you've shown us these things. I don't know why you've, you've chosen to show it at this time or what it's to achieve, but I pray that your name's glorified. It's exalted through these things. And as your people return to following your ways, they can begin uh, to return to following the calendar that you've laid out for us. Thank you that you've brought all of us together today. Thank you that you've brought all the people from all over the world to come to Sukkot. And thank you that we can rejoice in these things before you as your people. I don't know what you're doing, but I thank you for it. Amen.